everyone. I want to welcome you to our Publishing During the Pandemic panel. I'm Randall Foster. I am Vice President of Business Development and GM of the Nashville operation at Symphonic. Uh, with us today on this panel, we have uh, some, some great panelists who are going to impart some great knowledge about uh, how we see publishing looking and working during this time and beyond. Uh, so without any further ado, let me please introduce our esteemed panelists. With us today, we have Penny Gaddis, GM at Eclipse Music Group, GM meaning general manager. I wish people would just type these things out. Melissa Emmert Hutner, who is vice president of A&R at Cobol from New York. We have Shannon Hatch, president at Forward Music. We have E.T. Brown, senior director of creative services at CSAC. And last but certainly not least, Joining us today is Samantha Cox, Vice President of Creative for uh, New York, uh, who's with BMI. So panelists, welcome. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, the way we're gonna discuss this, uh, we're gonna talk about business and creative because obviously in publishing, uh, these are two, two major, <laughs> major pieces of the pie. And so um, I have pulled some statistics and I have some information that I've found on the business side of this thing. And, uh, and so we're gonna dive in there. We'll end up in the creative side of things. So the question, the big question at hand is, um, how is the publishing business at large? How, how you know, th these are unprecedented times. And so, um, you know, from, from the Goldman Sachs report and other publications like Music Business Worldwide, et cetera, et cetera, um, uh, we, we see headlines, you know, that are quite bleak, you know, that right now it's reported that a third of musicians could be forced to leave the industry due to COVID, which is awful and, and horrible. And obviously touring is stopped, et cetera, um, for the most part. But at the same time, there are numbers and statistics that are a little bit favorable. And so <clears throat> it's going to be really interesting to have a discussion here with regards to that. But streaming this year, or streaming is supposed to exceed 1.3 billion users by 2030, not dollars, users. Um, so that means that we are on a trajectory for growth in streaming. You know, in 2020 alone, uh, industry-wide revenues are up at least 25% across the board, with the only exception being live. Uh, publishing acquisitions still seem to be at an all-time high. Um, you know, major labels uh, have surpassed last year's numbers, and even earlier in this year, it was said that they are making more than $1 million an hour from streaming. Streaming certainly does appear to be one of the stalwarts that is holding out during this. Um, and, and, uh, <clears throat> and, and last but certainly not least, Music Business Worldwide last month just projected streaming revenues to grow by more than 1 billion in the US in 2020, despite a pandemic. That's, a, that's big growth. And so, um, you know, I'm just curious how this, how this trickles into publishing. Um, I'd like to start out with our PROs because obviously public performance is, is a big, big chunk of the PRO revenue stream, general licensing being a, a big piece of that stream. Uh, have you seen any changes? Is there anything, um, is there anything that you've noticed infrastructurally on the, on the collection side um, to our PRO experts here? You want to start? Uh, yeah, good point. Um, yeah, I'll, uh, well, yeah, I'll jump in. So yeah, I mean, it's definitely, as you said, you know, with the live music not being a a functional part of the industry right now. Um, you know, that, that's obviously where the, the biggest difference is. Uh, you know, there's a few main areas of licensing when it comes to the PRO side of things. You got your radio, your TV, and the other big one is general, right? So general licensing is all the bars, all the venues, all the restaurants, all the clubs, all the things that are hurting the most right now. And so obviously we don't have teams of people calling them to try to get them licensed for music that's not being performed in their establishments. And, uh, and so of course that's going to have an effect uh, on, on the overall picture because it's a big part of the picture. Um, so, you know, I know from, from at least our side right now, our main objective right now is to be offsetting that in ways to keep things as stable as possible, you know, by, you know, we're obviously not having our, our big awards parties like usual. We're not uh, sponsoring events that aren't happening. We're not uh, spending a lot sending our teams out to with uh, T and E expenses to go see bands and things like that. So um, yeah, we have promotions and, and hiring freezes and things like that. So it's it's very much a focus right now to uh, try to offset 
how that income is going down, but in a, in a way to even it back out to keep things as stable as possible for songwriters to survive through this period. Very interesting. So, Samantha, do you have any, any additional yeah, I mean, ET really said it so nicely. Um, <laughs> we're, we are clearly um, not generating as much money in, in general licensing like we have in past years, right? But I think the real positive thing is um, we're looking at other streams of revenue though too and trying to figure out how we can collect on these new ways that um, through, through live streaming, right? And we're looking at all these different new ways that people are adapting to not be able to play live. And we're going, hey, how can we license these new, these new things, right? And um, I'm not licensing, so I'm not an expert in this, but I do know from our licensing department that those are the types of things that we're doing. And of course, we're cutting back, just like ET said, when it comes to our award shows, uh, traveling, any expenses, basically we've cut them all. So um, <clears throat> I think um, it's exciting times in a certain way though, because we're learning how to adapt and, and these new models and these new ways of, of people earning money uh, or, or songwriters and artists earning money online, we as political and rights societies are finding out and figuring out how we're going to license those new streams of revenue. So in a way, it's ex it's really exciting because there's new things too. And then hopefully once the live streaming business gets back into business, we'll have that as well. I've said all along, I, I feel like <clears throat> is as awful as, as the lack of live concerts and things has been to the industry. I feel like long-term, talking 10 years down the road, I think the growth and development that occurs during this time and, and really the creativity that happens um, with these creations of new new revenue centers and things. I mean, you know, TikTok was was happening before this, but man, has it blown up. You know, there are uh, other technologies blowing up coming, coming on board currently. And I, I think that, you know, if we can hang on through this, I think that it's gonna be positive down the road. Um, I, now, I know I don't have any sync experts on this panel and I firmly coming from this, that space, you know, have paid, a lot of attention to, to sync. And I know from speaking with John Mizrahi, who runs Bodega Sync, which is our, our um, sync company, that, you know, during the, during the beginning of the summer when Hollywood shut down, it was, it was really kind of dire times for that line of revenue. And obviously with publishing, sync is a big piece of the pie. Um, you know, you know, do you, any of you, have any of you noticed that personally, um, you know, his comments to me were that during the summer that, that when TV sync fell off, it seemed that the ad business kind of came up and, uh, you know, there, there seemed to be more interest and more briefs um, pivoting to that side. Is, have any of you seen or heard any of this? 100%. Um, uh, part of Forward is based in LA and relies a lot on the TV and film industry. And so we have a division that ha has over 35 talent clients. Mm -hmm. And we watched those, you know, this, the TV shows that were in production and the films that were happening completely stop, which was part of what we modeled forward publishing for, you know, to create music for those places. So it's been interesting, but we did see a lot more, like you said, ads um, mm -hmm. and positive messaging in ads, which, you know, is good for the soul and good for everybody. But yeah, it has changed drastically. We see, I see a lot of it picking back up, but with the production of TV and film, they're doing it a little bit differently than they were before. Smaller crews, smaller sets, um, the social distancing of groups of people to be able to do that. And I believe probably we'll see a lot more animation in the future too. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I actually, I know a number of music supervisors who've left LA completely because their work has gone completely virtual and they've been able to, to continue to exist in that space. Um, obviously, revenues from, from syncs and or from streaming are, are always months in arrears with, with the PROs, but have, have you all seen any indicators at all at this point, or is it too early to tell, Samantha, E.T.? For me, I think it's too early to tell at this point, but, but I mean, it's clearly going to be affected, you know, somewhat, right? I mean, just by what's happening as, as the shit, what Shannon just said. So um, right now I don't see anything, but 
I could see it coming down the line. Yeah, well, yeah, the, uh, the TV side seems to stay has been pretty stable. I mean, there's stuff still being aired on television, so there's still royalties being generated. Um, obviously, as far as new blood into that world uh, has gotten a little bit harder, but that again, that's still that seems to be picking up lately. I've uh, I've heard from a lot of people who are putting together online sync camps, and uh, you know, we just had the Nashville Film Festival went virtual this year, and it was. Uh, you know, pretty successful as far as attendance and participation. So uh, that world seems to be figuring out how to keep clicking. Well, and that's that's actually a great pivot point here as we're talking about virtual and we talk about live streaming and things. Obviously, we're in a panel right now on Zoom, and so um, things have changed. Have you have you all seen or have your companies or has, has friends in the industry embraced other new forms of technology that have uh, that have either made better or, or helped adapt your day-to-day -day workflow? I mean, I would say for us, Zoom, like we're on, you know, previous to the pandemic, um, I would say most of my writers had never done a Zoom write. They maybe had never even been on Zoom and they've all adapted really well. And everyone misses being in person writing, but I think down the road, it's also opened opportunities where it's, more normalized to ask someone in the UK for a Zoom write or have a steady weekly write with someone, you know, in a different area of the world. I have one writer who lives in Houston and previous to the pandemic, he was mostly writing when he would travel to Nashville every couple months for a week. And now he's writing every week on Zoom with all kinds of people. So I think um, the Zoom writing, you know, Everyone's anxious to get back to normal, of course, but I think it is going to be a, a, a good thing in the future to have that as an option. I agree. I mean, just to echo what Penny is saying at BMI, um, we do, we'd ha we would do a lot of, um, you know, in-person events. We, we do this thing called speed dating for songwriters, where we would have um, uh, 12 writers come in. We'd have four top liners, four producers, and four artists, and we would all meet together at the New York BMI office. It, in, and by the end of the night, everyone would have met each other. Of course, we have food and drinks. Everyone hangs up and hangs out in a really great time. Um, and we had to quickly adapt, right? And we're like, okay, how are we going, how are we going to do this moving forward? And are writers going to want to do something less, like this on Zoom or not? And uh, what we found in, in the beginning, um, the bigger writers weren't so much into Zoom, but the up and coming writers were still extremely excited about it. And that's what speed dating is. So we were able to adapt and we just made it a little bit smaller. And then we bring six writers in and it's been a massive success. And, and, and what we're doing now is we're doing New York and LA speed dating. And we're also about to do a global songwriting camp. So I have to tell you, I know for, for us at BMI, it's been, of incredible because we can, you know, get someone from the UK on a call, you know, and with a with a LA writer with a New York writer. Now we have to do it at a certain time, clearly, because the time differences, but we made it work, right? And it's it's really been awesome. I think it's actually connected everyone more so. And again, it goes back to Randall, what you were saying. Like there's so many positives about all of this, right? And, and, and I'm excited about it because there's people that I normally wanted to connect with one another that I was never able to and, unless they were actually in the UK or actually in Los Angeles. And now it's, it's so easy and it's acceptable, which is even, even better. Well, and it's, you know, we're in such a, we, the music industry is such a global industry. And I think we all we all get in in in, in our little ruts. And, you know, we, I don't know about you guys. I had my conference cycle that I did every year. I went to here and here and here and here. And the reality is I don't have to go to meet in to talk to, to, to foreign sub pubs if I, if I don't want to. I, you know, they're a phone call away. Melissa, Cobalt is such an international company. Have you found, you know, across the pond collaboration to be something that's been on the rise for, for your songwriters? Yeah, I mean, I think the MO that Cobalt has is that we have one worldwide roster. This was before the pandemic because it's always been our outlook. So that even pre-COVID, when you would sign with a particular a and in a particular office, we would encourage everybody to connect with 
the a and r's and all of the other offices we have 11 offices worldwide so then you feel that you know that family effort you have multiple people sending you opportunities so that was sort of the pre-COVID outlook. And I think now even more so um, because of everything that, you know, Samantha was stating and Penny was stating, it's just sort of the same kind of thing that now that people don't have to travel and, you know, base it around touring schedules, we can put different artists and writers in with, you know, artists and writers, creatives in, other cities around the world. Um, you know, I think it, it's weird. It's been this, um, it's been sort of the silver lining, I think, of this whole crazy pandemic is that there has been sort of this like emergence of even more creativity and with everybody being on somewhat equal playing fields now uh, with accessibility. And as long as they're comfortable with Zoom or writing on online and for us not everybody is we have some people that aren't and we do have some people that do are starting to do in-person sessions safely but um yeah i think there's definitely been a really big boom in um zoom sessions with people located all over the world um that was just wouldn't have been able to be possible in this kind of way pre-covid so i sort of look at that as um i think as we all do is like what can we take from this that there's been this like surge of creativity sort of touching into so many more people than it was possible before. Well, well and I think, I think it's awesome that your company thought globally before they needed to think globally. Yeah, <laughs> because I, that's, I, that's a big way that I think that um, it's something that is very important to everybody at our company, especially our founder and um, everybody there is just that team effort and um, it, it really does, it, it always helps brings a lot of additional opportunities to the clients, but now even more so. And I think even for us on the, on the staff side, we would keep up um, with all of the other offices a lot because we do work together a lot and sometimes we do deals together um, if it makes sense for signing that particular client. But I feel like now we're all communicating even more than we were before um, because of this, which has been great too. So um, there's been a lot of positives that have sort of come out of this great time on the creative end for sure. That's awesome. Um, you know, outside of co-writes, I'm, I'm curious as creatives, um, and I'm, I'm talking to the three publishers in the room here. Well, actually, you know, the PROs do this as well. When you're looking to sign talent, you know, I, the old Nashville walk down the street with your guitar in your hand, knocking on all the doors thing doesn't work anymore. Well, I mean, it didn't work anyways, not, you know, not for the last couple of years, but the, um, you know, there used to be a real way that the creatives and creators would court each other for, for, for publishing deals. And um, have you seen changes to that? I mean, aside from the lack of face to face, are, are the rules of engagement still the same? Is what they used to be, um, or or has everything been turned on its ear? Well, I think it's harder to court. The dating process between publisher and writer um, is definitely a lot more difficult. Um, I'm new to publishing, but not new to songwriters at all. Um, but getting to know someone, and uh, Penny, I think everybody can attest to this, seeing them even live as a songwriter is so important to me because it is a large part of how they operate and how they handle other people. And that's something that I've really missed is being able to go out and see the songwriters play the shows. Um, it, Zoom, while it is extremely effective, it is less personal as we all know. Um, and so there is a bit of that lacking as well. Um, you know, the, getting to know the person genuinely um, and with anything I have done in the music business, I've created an addition to my family. So bringing in people this way is a little bit more difficult than when you're sitting there in front of somebody or watching them play and interacting with the crowd. So yeah, it has been challenging for sure, but overall, you know, we've, we've signed probably five, five writers during the pandemic, writer producers. And I've see, I see that they're working together a lot as well as with the pockets of writers that they are familiar and comfortable with. But I'm also getting um, larger percentages of copyrights because a lot of people are sitting doing it solo or creating 
mm-hmm. so much of it and then bringing one another person in on it. So that's been really great. I would say to echo what Shannon sa- said, it it is hard from a signing standpoint because you do want to see people play and the old fashioned way, which I think is still the way is, you know, getting to know someone. I look at a signing, you know, I'm probably going to work with you for three or four years. So I really want to know you. And it is hard to do that over Zoom. Um, But we still have some signings in the works still. So it hasn't really slowed us down necessarily. Um, I think that for me, you know, we have seen a lot of people get record deals from TikTok during this time. And so I am more in tune than I was before to really paying attention to what's going on on the digital platforms. But at least for Eclipse, our signings are still being led by not just analytics, by music we believe in and people we feel we've gotten to know and believe in. So we are aware of all of that and taking it into consideration and wanna be a part of those conversations. But I would say we're still kind of doing it the old fashioned way, even if it's getting to know someone over Zoom or, you know, having, you know, a meeting somewhere where we feel is safe and socially distanced. But from a signing standpoint, I think we're still kind of doing it the old fashioned way by going after writers we really believe in and believe in the music. Yeah, I I agree with everything being said. I mean, I think, What's interesting is now um, a lot of my signings are artists and um, obviously without getting to see them play, um, I've seen sort of a trend of artists that are now getting like sort of pro videos done of their practice sessions Mm -hmm. to give people a better idea of their presence. Um, and the way that they are performing. And uh, it's interesting, but I I do have to say that it's helpful because you you can still, I mean, once you sort of can get a sense of watching somebody perform, it is helpful than sort of going about it blindly. But as um, you both said at the end of the day, I think we also have to use our gut and listen to the music and say, you know, do I believe in this person? <laughs> to um, Do they seem like they're the right fit? Do I feel like I can help add to what they've built or what they're continuing to build? That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, you mentioned TikTok, <clears throat> Penny, briefly there. And I, it's, it seems like you can't talk about music in 2020 without TikTok being part of that discussion. And I know exactly the artists you're talking about because I tried to sign them to distribution deals and they were already talking to the majors. And so, um, you know, as a creative, when you, when you found somebody, you, you know, are you going through the old channels or are you getting up all up in the DMs? I mean, I, I have literally, you know, utilized Instagram like that to find and talk to distribution clients because that's where, especially that younger subset of, of writers and musicians lives. I mean, that's, that's where their fans are. That's where they're engaging. You know, there's no, there's no secret that TikTok and Instagram kind of have a symbiotic relationship um, with, with regards to moving, trying to move your crowd from one surface to the other. Are you, are you all, all up in the DMs? <laughs> I've definitely been in the DMs and um, yeah, I mean, it's so easy. I've found people I like on Instagram and I just send them a message, you know, it kind of breaks down that barrier. So I've totally done that. Yep. Same. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've even done a TikTok dance once or twice. I mean, not on TikTok. (laughs) Oh, I was going to say, I'm going to go find that profile. Oh no, just in the privacy of my own home with my daughter. That's what oh. we do. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. I mean, what, you know, you think about it, we would have never done that a year ago. Yeah. You know, a year ago, at least in Nashville, you know, it seems to be about taking people for beers at four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, you know, those Gosh, that, I miss those days. <laughs> those that enjoy enjoy that. But, um, but, you know, that's like, I keep coming back to, and we all keep coming back to like, there is silver lining sewn into this somewhere 
Um, what about on the for the PRO side of things? I mean, ha, ha, have has your day to day changed, Samantha, with regards to you know how the creatives at BMI are 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 engaging you know potential writers you know that you're trying to bring one hundred percent has. I mean, we talk about it all the time, and and even before COVID, frankly, you know, and this has just amplified it and and really made it. Um, you know, and put it in the forefront now. So um, I literally, I think we talk about it in every one of our creative meetings, right? And, um, and it, it, it's it, with me being older, it's also, it's challenging, right? So I'm on Instagram, I do all those things, but then I've got Katie who works with me, who literally lives on it and is finding and discovering things so quickly, right? That I, it, it would have taken me another, you know, another six months to then finally get on it, right? And, but so that being said, I think we are, I've got interns, I've got young creative people who are um, masters at it. And while I'm attempting to do it, and I do it from time to time, right? And they're, they're doing it all the time. Like over the summer, our interns, we had a whole program where I wanted them to look at TikTok and Spotify and all those charts and and look at the trending charts, what was happening, and keep me abreast of everything. So, um, is it overwhelming? Yes, because at a PRO, it's completely different. And we're looking to sign everyone pretty much, right? And whereas, you know, a publisher, you could be a lot pickier. And with us, we want to find, you know, whether it's, you know, the next Aunt Saunders or the next Rosie or the next whoever, right? And we want to we want to be on that, and we want to make sure there would be a my. That's awesome, Et. Any, any any additional CSAC notes to add? Yeah, I mean we're we're a little different in the sense that we we are selective, so we're a little bit more like like the publishers in that sense where we have a process of review on on who we decide who we sign and who we don't. But um, you know, and where a lot of that used to come from was being out and about at shows and and you know boots on the ground and meeting people and uh, you know you know relationships forming and seeing where they go as you know, as the basis of this whole industry and. Uh, so, you know, definitely, I think the day to day has gotten back to uh, as far as what what I do from the nine to five, quote unquote, office hours um, has gotten back to about a normal level of people having general questions and needing help with song registrations and wanting to get their songs heard and, uh, you know, stuff like that. But the, the, the after hours is where it's totally different, where I'm usually out, you know, five, six nights a week uh, seeing bands and talking to people and running into to other industry people at bars. Now I'm not doing that. So a lot of it is being a little bit more proactive about uh, connecting those dots. And, and too, just as far as, uh, like we were talking about before about how creatives are finding people, you know, I think a lot of our roles as creative people at PROs is, is that sort of in between of saying, hey, I've got somebody who's really good that you need to hear about telling all our, our publishing partners. And um, so these days knowing who's signing and who's looking for what is a lot more narrow and defined um, you know, because some people are starting to open up and sign some more. Some people are still not in a position to be able to do that. The ones who are, they're very specific things they're looking for. So being having to be a little bit more in tune with the the specific needs of each individual publisher or label, whoever we're trying to connect our, our writers to, um, has become a lot more important for sure. It really is kind of like dating, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And it, it's it's but it seems like right now we're all forced to use like a, a Tinder for musicians to make this thing happen. Yeah, the, uh, man, we should invent that. We should all do that. We can do uh, that. I actually you know a couple of people who've worked on two different projects like that. I haven't seen really? like, the fruition. It seems like it's a lot of a little more difficult than uh, just the <laughs> concept. But. So as we talk about the dating thing, I know that some of the people in in, in the audience here are those songwriters, those artists who are looking to figure out how they get a publishing deal in this crazy time. Um, you know, just to, <clears throat> from my experience as a publisher, you know, when I was, when I was at Olay, we did not take unsolicited anything. And, and we had our trusted partners at the PROs and our trusted friends and attorneys who would call us and say, Hey, you need to take a meeting with this person because they're, they're really fantastic. Is that still the order of operations? Is that still the, the, the way artists go about this? Or, or have the technologies opened the door a little bit more to some, you know, non-traditional means of outreach to get that publishing meeting? I think it's uh, everything. Um, I think it's sort of all of the above nowadays. I know, um, speaking for myself, and I think with most of my colleagues, you know, we still will get 
tipped off from contacts um, from a lot of our clients actually will tell us about people that they've connected with or that they really think are great that are looking um, that still is like a big percentage of what we all are tuned into but I think also it's just sort of like what Samantha was saying you're you're, you're probably like more in tune with just what is happening online in general on different charts um, things that are trending um, and it's sort of exploring all of that a little bit more. I, I feel like honestly, at the end of the day, the best advice for anybody is just keep doing what you're doing. Keep writing songs, keep putting stuff out there. I mean, nowadays there's so much content, but people want that. People are home for the most part. They don't have a lot of stuff to do. So they are consuming music more. So keep building your fan base, put content out there. And I think like when you're, when you're doing that, um, the music does get heard, get connected, get pushed on. Um, I still believe that the organic way is usually the way that things happen most of the time, at least in my experience, um, or those seem to be more of the lasting uh, um, ways to connect and get a publishing deal, even in COVID times? I would say too, for me, I mean, it, if you're a writer out there listening, it is great to have something come from BMI or come from a co-writer. If, if I get an email from someone that was sent from someone I know, um, you know, I'm more likely to open it because we do get a lot of unsolicited material. Um, and I, to echo what Melissa says, I think the organic way is the best way, but I also get that it's hard right now because often the organic way was being out and about at a show and running into someone. Um, but I would also encourage writers, if you feel like your music is really great and you're ready for a publishing deal, you know, it, it might catch my attention more if someone emails me and says, hey, congrats to Eclipse. I just saw you guys had this new release. And I've been following what you're doing and um, here are, I've got, you know, X amount of followers on TikTok or Instagram and, you know, give me kind of a, a reason to look at it and open just an email of look at me, I'm awesome, give me a publishing deal, you know, that I'm probably not as likely to want to dig into that if you show that you've done your research and you genuinely are familiar with our company and you've been working hard and have created some momentum on your own, then, you know, I think there's more of a chance in this Zoom email sort of only time for someone to click. The other thing is I think with, you know, in, in LinkedIn is not a new technology, but pretty much all of us are on there. And I would think that finding a mutual contact to help connect those dots is, is a valuable thing. Um, even even now. <clears throat> I'm, always, I'm always looking for, you know, someone who has put in a lot of work on their own. If your train is stationary and you want me to get it moving, I'm not really interested. But if it's already moving down the track and you can tell me some stuff that you've done on your own, you know, that's probably the time you're ready for the publisher to help it move a little faster. And so that's what I'm looking for if someone reaches out over email or LinkedIn or any of the other ways is to see that they've been working hard on their own. Yep. I want somebody that's going to work harder than I'm going, I'm going to work for them, right? I mean, this is their career. We can help them out. We can do so much that they have to be willing to do, put the time, effort and work into it. I always say that nobody can want this more than they do. That's right. That's exactly right. So, um, Randall, my husband just walked in, and I didn't know if maybe you wanted to ask him a question about the. Right yeah, let me right. tell. Let me tell everybody who who we're about to talk to here quickly. This is one of the beautiful things about Nashville is everybody's married to a dang songwriter here. Rob, it's good I to see you. Right, right, Penny. <laughs> yes. Is, for those that don't know, this is Rob Hatch, who is a hit country songwriter. I don't. I don't. I the list of songs he's penned is is too long to read now. But Rob, we're talking about um, really how publishing is changing in the middle of COVID with regards to um, the way writers are creating, you know, and the way publishers are helping writers create. Can you speak to your experience on being kind of an old school writer and having to adapt to Zoom? 
Sure. And he's not prepared. He just walked up the <laughs> stairs. I was like, oh, hey. I was just cleaning up for breakfast. I didn't <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, 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 Zoom, the Zoom writing started off really tough. You know, it's, uh, you're used to the old school way of sitting around and being able to bounce off of each other and play together and talk at the same time and all these different things we took for granted when uh, Zoom started. But as we've it's carried on, we've kind of realized it's a necessity. I don't really know what we would be doing without it sitting around. So um, just trying to be open minded about it and, and, and going into it, knowing that we have these limitations that we can't do and kind of getting ahead of it but really just trying to evolve with it and learn how to do it. Do you feel like the quality of your creative output is better today than it was pre-COVID or just different? I mean, that, that's the question I always have in thinking about it is you're right. Like there's so many times that writers just sit in a room and kind of BS here in Nashville until they come up with something they're going to do. Sure. And, and, and it's, it's a little awkward to just, you know, do that <laughs> over a video. I've call. noticed a lot less BSing. Yes. Like, let, let's get down to it. Well, you either, if you have an idea to write with uh, that day, then, then you kind of jump on it. But the, the nature of sitting around for two hours and talking your way into a hook doesn't happen as much because you can't really talk at the same time and you can't really play at the same time. And, you know, that, that dynamic has changed a little bit. So uh, it makes you do a little more prep work ahead of time, actually. You go into writes with ideas and plans and how about this? And, you know, you know what you have to deal with. So it'll be, it'll be interesting to see if that prep work continues once things are back to normal. Sure. Um, sure. Awesome. Well, Rob, thanks for joining us here briefly. Appreciate you, friend. <laughs> Sorry, to you. Sorry to put you on the spot, hon. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Melissa, he's a cobalt writer as well. So he's oh. yeah, cobalt and a sea uh, And a sea sack writer. Uh, yeah, and it's all so incestuous here. All part of the panel. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take awesome. Me. Love it when a plan comes together. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome. So, so I think we've covered a lot of bases here. And, and, and I think what I'm seeing is, is generally speaking, we've got a positive outlook possibly here. I mean, obviously those who are cashing performance checks and trying to pay the bills, you know, have struggles and, 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 uh, and we all are, I think, incredibly empathetic to that. Um, those of us, you know, who are married to them, <laughs> those of us uh, who count them among some of our best friends, but it does feel like um, there's potential for, for lots of upside out of this when it's, when it's all said and done. Um, we've talked about the technology and how we're using that to discover new talent. Can we talk a little bit about, you know, your most important metrics beyond the song? I, I know everybody says, everybody says it's all about the song. It's got to be, it's got to be about the art. Um, but what, just for the audience, so that, so that as these writers are trying to do the work, Penny, as you said so eloquently, how do we, you know, how, how do we evaluate the work outside of the song? And what, sh what do you think they should be paying attention to as writers and performers? I can, I can jump in on this one. Um, I, I think that what Shannon said is really key. I think that you have to feel that that drive. It has to really come across um, because it's a lot of work um, for everybody, and you want people that you that have already been out there hustling and that are sort of focused on doing that. And I think that even if you hear somebody and maybe it's not quite the exact time for them to have a pub deal. Um, you hear, you can see what they're doing. You see they have that in them where they are just gonna keep working at it until it happens and they're not gonna stop. And that is so appealing, that in itself. And uh, on the opposite, when you meet someone that's very accomplished and doesn't have that and is sort of just like, uh, you know, they're looking at signing a deal with a publisher and like, that's going to take care of everything. And they almost take a step back. That's very unappealing. And you, I think you can pick up on that pretty quickly. Um, but I think outside of that drive, which is so important, I think you, I, I personally look for people that are sort of aware of what is resonating today. Um, the song structure, you know, is it, if they're writing songs that are completely different than, 
you know, what is resonating on the radio, what's resonating on TikTok, what's resonating on all these different platforms. That's going to be a very different kind of artist to work with, um, a very different kind of campaign and plan you're going to have. And maybe that's not the right fit at the moment. But I, I think that I always look for someone that is sort of aware of what's happening, tuned into that, and, um, you know, has sort of studied that, has studied what's charting, what's resonating. Um, and so they can either take that into their art or they're making a conscious decision that they're not going to, but it's sort of that that is clear and they're clear with that too. My team, um, I've got two guys that work for me out in LA and, and we have, during all of this, what our first and primary thing we're looking for is Swiss Army Knives. And it's kind of been, you know, what, what we all look for, but, you know, that's been our MO from the beginning to find those writers, artists, producers that can do it all, that can create and turn it around right then and there. Um, and, and talented, of course, ones, ones that are good at it. Um, but, you know, that's, that's what our big deal has been, you know, finding the people that can make it from start to finish by themselves. And it's been interesting to see how people, the uh, even top liners, for example, and how they're adapting, learning how to use Pro Tools, learning, you know, new, honing new crafts during this because out of necessity. Mm -hmm. I would say too, in addition to that, which is kind of what Melissa said too, mm -hmm. I'm in addition to listening to the music and liking the music, I'm looking at their work ethic. And I also, whether it's an artist or a writer tend to gravitate towards someone who has a point of view. I mean, especially as an artist, someone who knows who they are or is on their way to really knowing who they are um, and has a point of view. And from a writer perspective, you know, obviously someone who's strictly a writer is leaning into what the artist wants to say. But I think um, the writers I gravitate towards also bring their own sort of unique ingredient to every writing session. And that's something that I'm looking at. So I'm hearing it's not so much about the numbers, the statistics, it still lays deeply, deeply in the creative and in, and in the work ethic for you guys. Yeah, I think so. I think because for all of us, no matter what company you work for, when you're signing, um, signing a client, signing an artist or songwriter, no matter how long that deal is, that's still an agreement, that's still a pact that you're making, that you're both gonna work as hard as possible to help elevate whatever is already going on to help build that momentum. And um, yeah, it's, I think beyond just having one great song or whatever sort of pulls you in, it's having that, um, the rest of that sort of uh, rounding it out that's going to make that a good um, working relationship for you and whoever you're signing to the company and vice versa, whoever is looking to you as the publisher and having that, um, that right relationship and connection. That's so refreshing to hear because obviously you know, I wear multiple hats at Symphonic, but one of my hats is, is signing talent to distribution deals. And I, I hear people too often, you know, talking way more about the statistics than they are about in the numbers than they are about the actual songs. And, well, that uh, makes sense in the distribution world too, though. I mean, you know, thinking about it from the, the number, but I mean, I'd be lying if I said that I haven't looked at it, you know, just it's, it's part of what I want to look at, but it's not the driving force in who I sign. So it's in the mix. That's good. So we're almost out of time here. Um, you, you know, I'm, I'm honestly out of questions at this point. <laughs> Any predictions for, for 2021 that, uh, that anyone wants to throw out there of, of where we see this thing going? I mean, obviously we all are hoping that you know, the pandemic aside, um, that we're going to see, um, you know, medical progress towards this thing and, and us getting back to a new normal. But are, are you seeing anything uh, um, that you'd like to throw out there uh, as a parting shot? And there's silence on the panel. No, it's, it's kind of scary. <laughs> it's scary. It's very it's very manifest. I'm not sure which one. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know that any anybody has a crystal ball and can tell you what next year is going to look like. But the one thing I do know is that people will still be making music. People will still be consuming music, and we're going to figure out the in between. Amen. 
the creativity mm-hmm. I think will continue to grow and um, and relationships will continue to form between people all over. I think that's just going to keep building and building and um, hopefully connect a lot of really talented people with each other in ways they wouldn't have been able to do previously. Awesome. And I just well, want to say that, I, oh, sorry, Randall, that was going to no, say, you know, go you for it. from the beginning, uh, the statistics on streaming. And I think that just sort of um, shows that uh, PROs, you know, that's where the majority of our, you know, our income's coming from streaming, right? And it's growing and growing. And on, to leave on a positive note, I, I truly do believe that we're in a good place. And while we're in a difficult place right now, things are only going to get better. And I think PROs are going to be bigger than they ever have been. So that's awesome. I want to make a I, I totally <laughs> agree. And um, I come from the PRO world as well. So I, I think that, you know, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC have all been looking at new ways to monetize. And, and that's what needs to be happening going forward in the forward space. Um, I'm extremely hopeful. Um, looking back historically in times of economic depression or turmoil in our country, music has prevailed and it is a way to unite people and rem- remind each other of our humanity. And so, I, you know, that's, I'm, that's, I can't wait to see what happens down the road. I love it. Well, thank you all so much. Thank those of you in the audience for joining us. Um, this is the moment in the panel where I say, please give our panelists a nice round of applause. So we do this. And uh, I, I just very much appreciate you all joining us today and imparting your wisdom on uh, on this panel and on this topic. So thank you, Penny. Thanks for having us, Randall. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so awesome. much. Penny, it was so nice to see you. You too. And you too. Good to see everyone. Nice a family you. reunion. No. All right, all. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.